Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Every part of comics and artwork is a form of communication with other people. It's not just a, here, let me direct my thoughts at you as a dictation of concept, but it's hoping to convince you of how cool you think a visual could be or a story could be. And you're trying to communicate ideas and in one part storytelling and greater part just graphic impact. You're hoping to relate a sense of energy, urgency, and enthusiasm to people that there's a lightning of spirit that comes out of superheroes that has always worked for me. That it isn't really about the practicality of what they might do about, it's not the practicality about grown men punching each other in costumes. It really isn't about that. It's a visual metaphor. And that metaphor could be for a lot of things, but it's mostly just about the energy and enthusiasm that can be found in the fun of life. Welcome back, everybody. It's time again for Word Balloon Live, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Happy to welcome Matt Singer back. Matt Singer, Spider-Man expert, one of the best uh, critics I know, and is one of us, one of us, as they would say in Freaks, because uh, he's, uh, he's a good, uh, good-hearted good nerd that uh, appreciates genre fiction, and uh, I always love talking to him. Welcome back, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's nice to talk to you on video. I don't think I've ever, I, we've ever done it this way before. So yeah, I can no, look at I your, mean, I can talk to you and look at your beautiful face as we're discussing. This is great. <laughs> look, Steve Rotterdam from uh, Aftershock also watching. Oh, us. So, hi, good Steve. Steve. How are you, man? And uh, yeah, you know, honestly, man, it's a long time coming. Uh, I know we've had like, I, I think the Spider-Man book is the last time we spoke. And I think uh, in the ensuing uh, two years or so, it's been hit and miss in terms of, can we talk? No, we can't. Schedules aren't coinciding. So finally, uh, we're able to talk. And I wanted I'm to- I'm a very busy man, John. I'm very, very busy. Absolutely, man. No <laughs> question. And and forgive me. Uh, film Threat, Screen Crush? Which screen one? Crush. Screen Crush, excuse me. That is uh, Matt's home, ScreenCrush.com. Yes. And uh, and again, great critic, and I, I love your essays. I love when you uh, when you talk about uh, nerd fiction, and uh, whether it's uh, comedy or drama or action. Uh, and uh, you know, again, I, I wanted to do this uh, near enough to either the end of the year or beginning of the year that we could reflect on uh, the good stuff of 2021, not necessarily all the shit that we all have to deal with. But I guess that's part of the conversation too, because I want to talk about TV shows. I want to talk about films. Matt, I got to confess, I, I thought I would have seen uh, No Way Home, Spider-Man, uh, by the time we spoke. I haven't been able to do it yet, and certainly Omicron has been a factor on that. You haven't seen it. I haven't. You're the last person who hasn't seen I it. I know. I know. It did quite well, and I mean, everyone braved the elements and still went and saw it. Uh, there's part of me that, uh, I mean, it, it seems like I, I'm like uh, Charlton Heston, the Omega Man, eventually... <laughs> The, the virus is going to, I mean, especially Omicron, it seems like everyone's getting it no matter what. Yeah. You know, so I don't know, man. But uh, yeah, there is part of it. It's just like, yeah, if, I don't know. If you were Charlton Heston in the Omega Man, you would be spending every day in a movie theater watching Woodstock, actually. So that might not be the best. I see what you're saying, but that may not be the best example. But uh, yes, I I understand. I, I, I'm, I, I was fortunate enough to see it sort of right before... Uh, the cases uh, skyrocketed. Uh, it was the press screening of it, I think, was, you know, uh, a few days before it opened. And, and that within a week or two, it was it was quite bad. So I was I was glad to see it when I did. Yeah, I don't think I would have headed out after that with too much. I haven't seen it again. Let's put it that way. I saw I it, <laughs> but I have not. You know, I would like to see it again, but I have not. I haven't made a return visit to the to the theater. I will probably just wait 
for for what we used to call home video in, in some shape or form. Yeah. I'm hip, man, and I don't blame you. How was was it a filled press room or was it limited seating? How was it for the screening? It was it was pretty crowded. Um, it was at, at one of the, the theaters in um, in Manhattan where they tend to have a lot of press screenings. And there was a, 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 there was a, a there was a seat empty next to me, um, but there were generally not very many empty seats in the theater. It was pretty it was pretty crowded. If you're if that's a concern for you, it would, it would, I'm sure you it wasn't uh, it wasn't the best way to avoid getting covid let's put it that way i mean uh yeah it was it was pretty it was pretty crowded but i mean that's what you want for that movie you know you want that oh, yeah. you want that big enthusiasm and, and even at a press screening there was some some hooping and i mean i don't you haven't seen it i don't want to spoil what happens well i'm I, sure I, you have absolutely no idea at this point who <laughs> or what is in it and i don't want to ruin the surprise for you uh but uh but there was certainly some even in even in the uh amongst the stodgy staid New York film critic uh, scene there was there was a little bit of ooing and eyeing and cheering and whooping and wow weeping open weeping I know I was I don't know maybe Nobody maybe was for weeping. me a little bit okay. but <laughs> <laughs> oh my god no, no it, was, it, was, it was it was fun I mean I enjoyed it uh, you know well, it's, Matt, you're a, you're a massive not only I know I'm I'm sort Spider of Spider-Man expert and fan, but I mean, you know, you wrote your book and everything. What's your What's the title of your book again? It's uh, boy, I even mean, I can't remember it. It's so long. It's Marvel's Spider-Man from Amazing to Spectacular: The Definitive Comic Art Collection. I believe is the full. It just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> Uh, it's the, that's the full title. If you look for it anywhere under like Spider-Man from amazing to spectacular, it'll, it'll pop up anywhere you, you want to look for it. That's, that's kind of the, uh, that, that it'll show up on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or anywhere else you're looking for it. But that is the full title. Yes. It's quite, quite like worthy. It had a few, it had a few titles during the process of making it. So, and that part of it wasn't entirely in my, in my hands. That was more of the, the company's decision, but, uh, yeah, it's, I'm, it's a great book. Whatever whatever they wanted to call it was fine by me because they let me write exactly what I wanted. And, and that was the most important thing. You know, I, I, I got the SAG Awards coming up at the, the beginning of the month. And I really am woefully behind on film because uh, some sort of bureaucrat. I mean, what a what a first class problem. Let me just say. And everyone's going to say, yeah, F you, John. Who cares? But, um, you know, I, I've got used to getting screeners sent to me once the radio and TV uh, union merged with SAG. And now I am a SAG member, so I get my screeners, and, and it's great, and I get to vote on the awards, pre-Oscar award series, certainly. So so that's really nice, and I, and I feel incredibly honored and privileged that I get to do it. But um, there was some sort of bureaucratic snafu, and I was talking to my rep today, and they're like, oh, we're sorry. Yeah, we thought you had missed the deadline for your union payments, so we weren't sending you screeners. I'm like, hey. I'm like, here's the proof right here. They're like, okay, oh, really no. sorry. they're on the way. They're like, we'll we'll get them in the mail to you today. I'm like, all right, and they'll and they started sending me the links, but uh, I, I'll confess, I'm I'm going to be woefully uh, shy of of being able to contribute to any best film list uh, you might offer. I mean, I certainly saw my share of streaming films and stuff, but um, yeah, I want again, I, I if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to start with the movies because TV is rich and we've been we've been uh, embarrassed with how many great tv shows there were i mean i i'm looking for top five but i've got a list that goes beyond five and we could talk more about that as well but what about movies what, what were your big uh, movies for the year my big movies for the year um you know like uh, for me the the top ones was with stuff like dune i loved dune uh which uh actually kind of surprised me because you know you i'm i am a Spider-Man comic book fan, you've you've established that already, but I am not like a crazy Dune nerd. Like that's 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 almost too nerdy even for me. That's like <laughs> over the edge uh, of of where my nerd cut off. Like I'd never read Dune. Okay, uh, I you know I've seen the David Lynch Dune, and I always sort of looked at it as kind of an amusing 
um, work of insanity. Like I don't really under, I never really understood it. I would watch it. People would be talking and I would be trying to understand what was happening. And I'd be like, I got, I don't know. I would, and I would just <laughs> give up and I would just go along and enjoy the costumes and the sets and the sandworms and the, and the madness yeah. and the weirding yeah. and, and all that stuff. And, uh, and the new Dune was, was like the moment where it was like, Oh, I get it. You know, it was like the moment where suddenly someone, uh, took all this, you know, because you hear about people talk about it as this incredibly canonical thing. And, you know, even before David Lynch wanted to make it, so many different filmmakers have wanted to make it. And and the version that never happened by Alejandro Jodorowsky, you know, famously, like all the people who worked on it went on to make all these incredible films like Alien and all these other things. So, it, you know, it has this revered status, even amongst a dummy like me. Um, and so seeing Denny Villeneuve's doom was like the moment where I went, Oh, okay. I, now I understand why sure. people are so obsessed with it. And now I'm eagerly awaiting the second movie. And, and, uh, and, and I really, I really loved it. So that was, that was way up there for me. Um, what other stuff did I love? I loved um, Nicholas Cage's pig. I don't know if you saw that it or did. heard about that. It did, and I enjoyed it. And I enjoyed Dune as well. So very good. Keep going. Yeah. 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 No, pig that was, Pig was great. It was a nice redemption for Cage, who obviously yeah. has been in the wilderness uh, movie wise, kind of yes. making any, anything and everything. Yeah, he was he's been in the metaphorical wilderness. And in this movie, he was in the literal wilderness living, you know, in the middle of the woods, I guess, outside of Portland. Uh, and, it, you know, it sounds like when you when you hear the description, you know, it, like it sounds like a terrible Nicolas Cage movie, like the kind of stuff he makes 10 of them a year now, like a man loses his pig and he goes on like a hunt for the pig and to get revenge. Like it just sounds absolutely silly and ridiculous. And then, you know, to my wonderful surprise, like it's not what you expect at all. Like that is what the movie is about to some extent, but it's not like a revenge movie. It's like this very touching, melancholy, beautiful character study of this broken man and, you know, Cage is not doing the over-the-top Nicolas Cage stick at all. It's a very nuanced, very touching performance. And, you you know, you go in this whole Portland culinary scene and you kind of get lost in that world with him. And so that, to me, I thought was one of the, one of the best kind of surprises of the year. I really, really loved that movie. Uh, so if people haven't seen that, I'm pretty sure that's already available for rental at least. Um, that's absolutely worth seeing. Dune, of course, was on HBO Max. I think it might be gone again because of the way their that right. whole deal works. But it'll be—I mean, if it's not on there right now, we'll it'll be that. back. It'll be back on there pretty soon. Sure. And then um, what? Other, I mean, m my favorite movie of the year, which is uh, you know, it's I love <laughs> talking about it. It's not exactly a, a classy uh, film, but uh, probably. Is, shouldn't even be called a film. It's more of a movie, but it's uh, Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar, which uh, just an absolutely delightful comedy that uh, I'm sure will win a lot of Oscars. I'm sure you'll be voting for it in the SAG Awards as well, John. <laughs> and uh, just a hilarious, hilarious movie. And, you know, like um, uh, 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 in this time when we can all use a laugh, I found myself... Uh, First of all, the first time I saw it, I thought it was brilliant and laughed hysterically. And I've just returned to it over and over. And, you know, I'm as guilty of anybody of, you know, when I make my top 10 list every year, that's part of the job. It's like, I don't, I, I try to include some comedies in there, but it doesn't happen too often. And this year, I mean, that was the movie that resonated with me and I loved it. And I've seen it so many times and, uh, you know, I've looked into real estate in Vista Del Mar. It's a little too pricey for me, but maybe someday. <laughs> but but uh, so I, I kind of had to just be honest <clears throat> and say that that was really my favorite movie of the year. And so so that was, you know, if you find my list on Screen Crush, that is that is the number one. I think Dune was number two. And I think I think Pig is number three. If not, there might be something else that's, you know, three and that's number four. But those are the those are the the three that really come to mind to me first of all so and and barb and star for sure i think it's available on hulu actually you could rent it probably but i think you can actually just if you have a hulu account i think you can just stream it you know as part of your subscription and if you need a laugh i i mean if you can't laugh at that movie we we have problems we have big big problems i'm hip i i understand how about uh did you see one night in soho 
I did. I liked One Night in Soho. Yeah. I thought that was, um, I thought, you know, not my favorite Edgar Wright movie. Or la is it Last Night in Soho? One Last Night, night in Soho. Thank Last you, Night in Soho. Yes, okay. indeed. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not my favorite Edgar Wright, but I thought, uh, a, you know, a worthwhile movie. I really, I thought visually it was beautiful. And, you know, I thought the highlight was, um, you know, the sequence, the, the early sequence where the girl sort of, you know, finds herself transported back to the past and she's kind of switching places with, uh, you know, Anya Taylor-Joy's character. I thought that sequence was incredible and definitely one of my favorite scenes of, of the year. Um, some of the stuff at the end, the twists at the end, which I, I, I don't want to spoil for anybody. I didn't know if it all entirely worked and landed, but, uh, you know, very enjoyable film. I certainly would recommend it. Um, and yeah, visually some very, very stunning moments, you know, especially some of the tricks to get, because the idea is that this woman from the present is somehow transported to the past. And so she's kind of like switching places with this woman who existed in the 1960s. And so the way, you know, Edgar Wright always, you know, has incredibly deft camera work and editing and stuff. And so the ways that he, you know, there's like, almost, there's like a dance sequence where the two women are sort of switching places seamlessly with, uh, and, and dancing with uh, Matt Smith's character. Um, just tremendous. Absolutely one of the highlights, I thought, visually of uh, any movie I saw last year. How about the Bond film, No Time to Die? The Bond film, I thought, you know, what I, I while I overall would, I'd say I, I, I enjoyed it. I'm a big Bond fan. So, it, you know, like, um, I'm sort of in the tank for Bond. Um, so I, I would say that I liked it, but I did walk away from it feeling a little bit like um, th th that maybe as much as I enjoyed Daniel Craig's Bond, I did feel after this movie, like maybe they should have made Skyfall his last movie. Because like that movie, like on a meta level, it really was sort of like a curtain call state of the bond union. Why do we need bond in the modern day, which they seem to do every five years anyway. But I thought that was a particularly good version of that, you know? And I thought it was, you know, obviously, you know, one of the most beautiful bond movies, just visually um, well-directed, exciting, amazing action. And it, and it had something to say about the character and it just felt to me like looking back on the the two movies that they made after that, that they kind of just kept rehashing that same like question of like, do we still need Bond? What is the point of Bond? And I was like, didn't we settle this like a, one movie ago? Didn't we just go through, didn't we do this? And, and quite satisfactorily, like I think Skyfall is one of the very best Bonds. I like um, Skyfall as well. Yeah. I, that's and a so, movie, but I do like it. I mean, I thought Spectre was kind of a. I, I I think this movie was better than Spectre. I thought I thought that one was just kind of a total uh, mess. Missed opportunity, Spectre. Right, right, Big exactly, missed opportunity. Yeah, exactly. Especially having Christoph Waltz's Blofeld, it it always comes down to the writing, and I absolutely agree with everything you said in terms of didn't we already decide? Yeah, Bond is still needed in right. the twenty first century. Um, it's a shame because Craig is such, I think, a great Bond. But I think he was let down um, sometimes by uh, circumstance, quantum of silence uh, happening in the midst of uh, a writer's strike. Uh, right. So that hurt. But yes. here, I, I do agree with you. And, and it's it's funny. I feel that way about Dalton even more so, given that it was only two movies. I'm a big I, I, another old movie reference. Uh, Boys Town, Father Flanagan, Spencer Tracy always says no such thing as a bad boy. There's no such thing as a bad James Bond. <laughs> Even, um, you know, uh, oh, shit, on Her Majesty, uh, shame George on Lazenby. George Lazenby. I think George Lazenby is a very competent Bond. He's not the actor that any of the others are, but he did fine. He was a solid Bond. And again, surrounded by the best Bond movie there was. And I think in the case of Craig, a great Bond that, uh, I mean, it, thank God for Casino Royale. That's kind of his perfect movie. And I really, really like Skyfall a lot as well, as you say. And I mean, I think we're out of spoiler range with uh skyfall the death of them would have been a, a way to kind of put a button on everything and, right. and i don't know i'm still divided on whether we needed to see bond die it's only james uh it's only daniel craig's james bond that dies and the character will continue i personally don't believe 
the next movie will only focus on the new 007. I really don't believe that. I think I, I, if they they might do it, I think it'd be a, a huge mistake because I think we want James Bond's story no matter what. I mean, it's a tough act to follow after uh, 50 plus years. Well, I mean, it, uh, yes, it does, the movie does end with, a, 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 you, you spoiled it for someone oh. who didn't see it, but yeah, the death of James Bond. But then if you stayed till the very end of the credits, it said, you know, James Bond will return. So uh, it's not exactly the most, uh, you know, it's, that's a real comic book death for you. You know, he dies, but they already, they're already promising you he'll be back in the end credits. I mean, that's like, he might as well be a member of the X-Men at that point if he's going to be... Uh, <laughs> dying and they're already like don't worry guys he'll be back you know he's encased in adamantium it's fine he'll just cut his way out in a couple of years don't even worry about it like uh understood yeah i i I, I, I think i mean look after 25 movies you know i guess it's that was something they had never done with bond so they're always trying to find new things and I, i i didn't have as much problem with that per se as i did just you know, I mean, to spoil more things, like all the rigmarole with um, Leia Sadu's character and they have a, a child, but they don't want to, like, say that it's his for a long time. And I thought the movie got off to a really great start. All the stuff with, you know, like there was that that crazy uh, car chase and the the stuff on the bridge and all, all the early scenes I thought were really excellent. Like it established this incredible mood and atmosphere and then it just seemed like um, sort of after they jumped ahead and there was it just, I don't know, it never quite sort of came together for me, you know, and and um, um, they had the character, is it Ana de Armas? Is that the name of the actress? I, she had that incredible her. like one scene where she absolutely steals the movie and then she's just never seen again. And you're like, come back. You're the best part of this movie. You're so fun and exciting yeah. and you're bringing all this energy to the movie and and then, and she's just gone. And then the rest of the movie just kind of gets, get very heavy and dour and, you know, like, you know, that's, I guess to a certain extent that is in keeping with the bond that we've had. And, you know, like the Daniel Craig bond was, you know, he's not exactly the lightest, quippiest bond, but no. um, I don't know. It got a little kind of heavy and dour and, yeah. I didn't think Rami Malek was a particularly interesting villain as well. So I agree with that as well. I think, like overall, I would I could say I mildly recommend it, or I enjoyed it. You know, like a three star movie, but I just didn't think uh, it really. You know, it, I certainly don't think it's the equal of Casino Royale or Skyfall, and it just it just didn't seem to it didn't quite land for me. You know, it's it was okay. I will I will definitely watch it again at some point, but it's it's certainly not one of my favorite Bonds. Well, and I'm and I'm really interested to see where the franchise goes moving forward. Um, Amazon. Acquire, did they finally acquire MGM? Is that is that a done deal? I don't know if that's like an yeah, if it's totally official. That that was certainly the plan. But of course, Bond has the rights of Bond are so complicated, and I don't know how much say they will even have once they do acquire MGM. So yeah, it's it's an it, I but but supposedly uh, that's you know that is what's happening. So yeah, I guess it'll be interesting to see whether you know like you know. James Bond is suddenly the official spokesman for for Amazon or in the next movie, instead of like a a watch or something, he's, you know, he has or his his watch in the next movie has Alexa built in or something. That will be that'll be really that'll that's when, you know, they've really jumped the shark when he's instead, you know, his fancy watch with all the gadgets is just an Alexa watch or something. Oh, yeah. He's he's carrying an Amazon dot with him. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, The purest. (laughs) <laughs> the purists will not like that. They will not be a fan of that. I am curious to see who the next Bond will be and what they do with the franchise moving forward. Um, and again, I agree with you, man. It was a, I think it was a great ride with Daniel Craig as an actor uh, and, you know, taking on the character. But yeah, I agree with you. I think there were more two and a half and three star movies than really Casino Royale, which I do think was such a, an amazing debut for him and such a solid movie and i like skyfall i like skyfall enough but yeah i don't know again i think miss more missed opportunities than great execution on on the bond franchise during the craig era um you mentioned obviously the x-men and i have to ask about marvel and uh the marvel movies what'd you think of the marvel movies this year uh so we had how many there were four four movies 
So we had there Black Widow, Black, Eternals, Black Widow, and Shang Chi, and Eternals, and Spider Man. So Spider Man, yeah, the four. Yeah. Um, I mean, I thought that <coughs> to be totally, I mean, to be totally honest, I, I mean, I thought that Eternals was maybe the weakest, one of the weakest uh, Marvel movies to date. That was to me was a really big disappointment. Um, the other ones I thought were all, you know, enjoyable. Um, uh, you know, Spider-Man I enjoyed quite a bit. And um, I thought Shang-Chi uh, was really entertaining. I thought it got off to a great start, like the action and stuff in the in the first hour or so. It was really fantastic. A lot of fun. The characters were great. I thought the, you know, the ending got a little bogged down and some, some, a lot. There was a lot of like CGI dragons and monsters for a movie about the master of Kung Fu. I don't know that I needed quite so much, you know, digital shenanigans. I would have been quite happy just to see more martial arts fight scenes like that great scene on the bus. And great. what was, and what was the other one? Black Widow. Black Widow I thought was, you know, that was again, was entertaining. You know, it was sort of odd to have that movie come out after the character has already died and have it be sort of a, you know, this flashback that we haven't seen. I wonder if the movie would have, you know, been would have played better, would have felt more important, quote unquote, if that movie had come out a couple of years ago. You know, I guess that the idea of uh, this character's, uh, you know, untimely demise is like hanging over the movie and perhaps trying, you know, lending it some extra gravitas in theory. I don't know that I necessarily felt that watching it. Uh, it felt more like you were seeing kind of like a, almost like a footnote, you know, like a, a well-made footnote. Um, so I think if I had to like rank them, I would probably rank Spider-Man first and then Shang-Chi and then Black Widow and then Eternals. Boy, I was, I was really disappointed by that one because I love the, the you know, the Kirby comics and um, Chloe Zhao, I think is a very talented filmmaker. I've really enjoyed her low budget movies um, and for whatever reason, I just didn't feel like her skills, her talents, I just didn't feel like they translated on the screen as, as certainly as much as I would have hoped they would. I, I, I thought that one was a, was a big, you know, as close to a, like a, like a flop as, as Marvel has had, uh, in quite a few years. Cause really, I mean, one of the things they're best at is that they have an incredible sort of, uh, quality control. It's like, even the Marvel movies that aren't, you know, five star classics, they're usually pretty entertaining with some great performances, great visuals. You know, there's always something to latch on to. And, and in that movie, boy, I don't know. There was a couple of uh, supporting performances that I liked, but it just didn't it didn't. That one did not do it for me. I, I was very let down by that one. Well, again, I'll be watching that in two days. Okay. When, uh, <laughs> I'm just talking and talking. You have no, no, no I could no, have no, said no. anything I, there. Matt, uh, it's your job to see these movies. Um, I kind of consider it part of my responsibility for Word Balloon, and I'm a little disappointed in myself for not seeing more uh, in the calendar year. But then again, weird circumstances and uh, the convenience of being able to watch these things at home. I mean, you know, I... Um, so I get it. And I, you know, and for those who haven't seen it as well, I'm glad that as much as it's uh, an annoyance to Scarlett Johansson and the filmmakers that feel they're getting screwed out of, uh, you know, potential box office by them going to streaming and everything that I get it and it sucks, but I have to admit as a consumer, I'm going to take advantage of it. And I, I saw when we get to, you know, DC, I saw Suicide Squad, obviously on HBO max. I didn't go to see it in the theater. Uh, and I, uh, and I, and of the two that I did see Shang-Chi and Black Widow, I like them fine. Um, Black Widow, I hear what you're saying. I, and I agree with you in terms of the weirdness of placement, but I liked seeing all the Russian heroes and I thought that was a lot of fun. I love, um, blonde Black Widow played by, I always forget her name. Fighting Florence with Pugh. Me. Yeah. She's great. Say her name again. Florence Pugh. Yes. And she, man, Florence Pugh, she's amazing. And I loved her in Fighting With My Family, uh, that little wrestling movie yep, she yep. made. Yeah, which, she's, she's great. And she was great in Hawkeye, and we'll get to TV with yeah. uh, with Hawkeye, I'm sure, in a second. But, um, yeah, and I love Shang-Chi. I'm a massive Shang-Chi comic fan. I liked uh, the actor's uh, TV Canadian TV show, Kim's Convenience, that he did. Although, obviously, that was kind of weirdly problematic as uh, the, the uh, hype machine for Shang-Chi began. 
And uh, I'm disappointed to hear that. I saw it as Kim's Convenience, the Canadian um, South Korean show about a family and generational thing. Being Greek, it reminded me very much of my big fat Greek wedding. And it is that kind of older generation, younger generation, especially when you have family that, you know, comes across the ocean to America or in this case, Canada. Um, I appreciated all those uh, little differences and things. Again, I wasn't on the set. I can't speak to that. Uh, I'll, I'll accept the actor's, you know, version of the story to a degree, but I also feel like, well, it was made by South Korean people that created the original stage play and they were very much in the writer's room. And it's like, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I wasn't there, but that's a different thing. Um, but I thought, uh, yeah, I liked, I liked the two Marvel movies and looking, I'm looking forward to seeing Eternals. I'm a big, uh, not only, uh, Kirby cosmic fan, but also grew up in that era when, um, uh, God, now Eric Von Daniken, um, uh, Chariots of the Gods, and what they do now on the History Channel with Ancient Aliens. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, I, I got that first dose of that stuff when I was a little kid. Right. And it's like, wait a minute, the pyramids were a way to contact aliens, and, <laughs> and those cave drawings are, at, you know, alien astronauts? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Great. Oh, yeah. You know, sign me up. So It's so basically I, a documentary when you get right down to it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that stuff, you know, there's a little of that in there. So you'll get, you'll get, if that's what you want out of it. Yeah. I, yeah. Is it, I think it's going to be streaming on Disney plus pretty soon, right? Is it this is it, week? Is yeah. it this week? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. This week already. I mean, I will probably watch it again just to kind of see, cause it, you know, it really, like I said, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the filmmaker and there's some really talented people in the movie. You know, the actors has a great cast. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it was, a, it was a real head scratcher for me. Cause I was, I mean, of all the movies that were coming out this year, that was probably Marvel movies. That was probably the one that I was most excited about beforehand, you know, where it's like just the fact that they were making an Eternals movie and Eternals is so kooky and weird and fun. Yes. Like to your, to your point about like some of the stuff that Kirby was drawing on to, to make it, it's just kind of a fun, like mythology and you know the, the the little glimpses we had seen of it, it did seem like they had sort of you know they were going, you know they didn't they didn't water it down necessarily. In some ways, I guess they they did. The villains are, uh, you know, like the, there there are deviants in it, but they're not like the deviants in the comics. That's sort of the biggest deviation. Um, they're just kind of like weird generic monster alien guys, which was a bit disappointing. But um, yeah, I will probably watch it again on Disney Plus and and uh, see see how it plays a, a second time because I only saw it I only saw it the one time as well. Fair enough, absolutely. Um, God, it's funny because everything you said about Eternals it reminds me uh, almost ten years ago of whenever it was when uh, Casada and Bendis are like, guess what we're doing next? I don't know, Guardians of the Galaxy, and I'm like, why? <laughs> <laughs> And now, are, are, you know, aren't I an idiot? Because, you were yeah, right yeah. as ever, John. You the, exactly. you had your finger on the pulse. Have I ever, all, right, all right, a little tangent. You'll forgive me before we get to TV. Back in my radio days, there was a great trade magazine for the entire radio industry called Radio and Records. And um, they would release a top 30 each week for the big hits of the week and everything. And even though I was in Bloomington, Illinois, a small market station, my station was chosen to be part of the survey sample that they did nationally to compile their top 30 list. So I had a great relationship with all the record companies and they really wanted my opinion. So Good Morning Vietnam is coming out and they and they have the soundtrack and it's all classic oldies and stuff. And uh, they send me the album pre, pre-release and I listen to all the songs. I love it. It's great soundtrack. So upbeat. Sugar and Spice and Nowhere to Run by Martha and the Van Allens, all these great songs. And they're like, what do you think should be the hit, you know, that we should try and chart with? And I said, oh, no doubt. No, nowhere to run. Martha and the Van Allens, it's got that great Motown sound and, you know, that great percussion that you love in a in a great Temptation song or a Four Top song or a Supreme song. And they're like, what do you think about uh, What a Wonderful World by Louis Armstrong? I'm like, oh, that's such schmaltz. I almost got diabetes from, like, listening to it. <laughs> Way too sentimental. So once again, way to go, Suntress. Completely wrong. <laughs> you, you, I mean, you are, what's the opposite of like a kingmaker? You, you, 
You're I'm, the bizarro I'm, world, the kingmaker of the bizarro world. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a bad luck chart, man. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, don't don't listen to me about predictions. Absolutely. I always say, yeah, I was like that guy at Decca Records when they introduced the Beatles. Hey, guitars are on the way out. Nobody wants to hear guitars anymore. <laughs> way to go, Jeff. Absolutely. All right, let's transition now to uh, really, the isn't it, and, and truly, Matt, as, as a critic, I see this as a, a media observer. I wouldn't call myself a critic. But I am fascinated by the changing landscape of TV. And it, I think it's, it's incredibly exciting. I think uh, from a programming standpoint, things have only gotten more and more ambitious. Uh, the inclusion of the foreign market, you think of things like Squid Game and its great success. And um, man, I really think TV has grown up and COVID has accelerated the changes that were already coming. I mean, that's that's a very obvious comment on my part. But before we get to lists and everything, yeah, what do you what do you think of the the macro of uh, the TV landscape these days? For just in general, or in terms of like these superhero? Well, shows? we'll get to we can get to superhero shows, but I'm, my list includes uh, uh, things beyond uh, superhero stuff. But uh, what do you? Th- yeah, just what do you think of the 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 landscape before we get into superhero right. stuff and the like? Well, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, there's. You know, the, the, the movies right now are in such uh, a state because, uh, you know, the movie theaters weren't in the greatest of shape two years ago uh, before COVID. And so it's, you know, upended everything. I mean, yes, movie theaters are open and yes, uh, Spider-Man has done extraordinarily well. But if you look at every other movie that's playing in theaters besides Spider-Man, there aren't too many other bright spots. And so... Um, it, you do wonder like if, uh, what, you know, what is the state of movie theaters going to be in a couple of years? Is it really going to be a place where you just go to see Spider-Man or whatever the Marvel movie is? And that's it. I mean, maybe it's possible because the way, the way things are going, that's, that's kind of how it's, it's shaken out. And, you know, streaming has given us, you know, this uh, incredible access to all these, uh, other things. And, you know, you don't ever have to worry about are people going to go to the theater to pay $12 to see this movie when you're releasing something, film or television, uh, you know, on a streaming service. And so, um, yes, it is from a, you know, if, if all you care about is the, the content, it's an extraordinarily exciting. And John's like, yeah, I, that's right. I only care about the content. <laughs> You know, then then it is. It's a really you're right. I think it's a very exciting time um, because there's a huge amount of competition for eyeballs right now. And so all of these different services are gobbling up, you know, everything they can. And, you know, to uh, entice you, it's like if you have an interest in anything right now, if you can't find something to watch, like, I don't know what to tell you. It's like you're on your TV. You know, yeah. You know, I, it's funny because my kids are just kind of getting old enough to, for me to like talk to them as like the old man and be like, "You kids today, you don't understand how good you have it." When in my day, like they're mystified by the concept of like commercials. I was explaining commercials to them, like that. That was like unfathomable. Like I'm like, do you know how on YouTube there's like three seconds of something before we skip, and they're like, "Yeah." I'm like. Imagine having to watch those and not have to skip them. And they're in everything you watch. And they're like, what? Why? Why, why would why would anyone live like that? Or just the idea that they don't have everything available to them on demand. You know, like the, the concept of a TV schedule absolutely exploded their brains. That, that Yeah. Yeah. That, you mean I can't just pause, uh, you know, I can't pause spirit writing free so that I can go to the bathroom. I have to watch. What if I have to go to the bathroom? I'm like, well, you better wait, hold it or wait for a commercial. What? <laughs> what? Bendis's kid, his youngest boy, they were in the car and Bendis had the radio on. And uh, I don't remember what the hit song was. And the kids like played again. And he's like, I can't. Right. Play. It's you know, it's on the right. radio. You know, yeah. we play it again. And right. he would not take no for an answer. He did not understand that he couldn't get it on demand, like you watch it on YouTube or listen to it on Spotify it or is, whatever. It is wild to be the old man who's explaining this stuff to my kids. So yeah, they're growing up in this fun world where yeah, <laughs> everything is at your fingertips. Uh, it's on demand. You can start it. You can stop it. And you know, 
joking aside, like it that obviously has opened up the world of storytelling where, you know, you're not beholden to 22 minutes with breaks for commercials and people's distracted attentions. Um, and that's a big reason why TV has gotten so much better than it was when I was a kid, when most of it was, you know, entertaining junk, uh, because that's all it, you know, was assumed it could be. Um, so it's much, much more ambitious now. And, uh, and we're all luckier for it. I mean, it's, it's great. And it is, it is interesting to see, you know, like, I guess if you don't really, you know, if you don't care about movie theaters so much, I mean, the upside is that all these things are still getting made. They're just, you know, they're going to streaming They're, you know, or they're being made as miniseries instead of movies as well. There's a lot of that going on as well. Now there's things where you watch it. And sometimes, honestly, you watch it and you go, that didn't need to be six hours. Why didn't they just make that a movie? But Anyway, we're rambling and digressing all over. The no, place it's here. all part of the bigger macro conversation, I think. And and again, this is interesting. And he, as you said, pre-COVID, to stick with movies for a second, I was I kept asking uh, the people I know in the business. And when I say the business, I mean, of course, the industry. Uh, that's a Paul Schaefer, David Letterman line from forty years ago. Uh, but uh, you know, like, isn't it great that they that you do have the bigger canvas? Of a of a mini series, and you could tell a more interesting story. Mark Miller and I love Mark Miller, and um, when uh, when we were talking about Jupiter's Legacy uh, as a concept, and all of a sudden he made the Netflix. Well, prior to making the Netflix deal, I'm like, don't you see the like value of streaming that you have a much bigger canvas to tell a much more intricate story? And he's like, I don't know, man. He goes, I'm, I haven't I haven't watched regular tv i just buy dvds of seasons and that's how i watch tv um and at the time he wasn't sold and then of course after uh he made the netflix deal now he's all about hey See, in that case you were a kingmaker there you go you put you were like come on man get with it the future is these streaming miniseries and now that's what he's making so there you go there's one absolutely you. It's not all yeah. just uh guardians of the galaxy that'll never work give me a break are you nuts no one's gonna like a tree and a la little raccoon. <laughs> Good lord! What do you think, Star Lord? You think you're gonna sell what? You're gonna sell dolls of a talking tree? Forget about it. Exactly. <laughs> Call the factory. Oh, Don't are you gonna make a little baby tree next? Come on! No one will buy that crap. <laughs> um. Well, let's talk about TV. Um. And I do have a list ready, and I do have Beyond Five. Okay. But, well, you uh, might, I mean, you might actually watch more TV than I, than I do. I mean, I try to keep okay. up with it as best I can. So you tell me, right. you tell me. Well, my five favorites were, I'll give it to Marvel for Hawkeye. Hawkeye was great. We can talk about him individually in a minute. I love the Beatles get back. I thought that was amazing. Um, and again, it debuted on TV. So. No, that's a TV. Say, that's a, that's a, absolutely. It's a mini series. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Superman and Lois on the CW, I thought was exceptional. I thought it's the it's the best iteration of Superman going back to when they knew what they were doing with Richard Donner and Christopher Reeve, and that's only two movies, and that was a long time ago. But I thought uh, Tyler Hecklin was just so great. I, I, I accept the fact that when you're watching the CW, it's going to be a teen drama in a lot of ways, and that's okay. And I liked uh, I liked Clark's boys I, and Clark and Lois's boys. I got used to what they initially were and what they developed to be after 15 episodes. I thought Lois had a lot of agency in the series, as she should. I always I would tell my favorite DC writers for years, she's the best unused character. Why doesn't Lois have a solo series? She's an incredible character without powers, just tenacity. I mean, she's just amazing. And I think they covered that on the show. Uh, so that's three. And then Only Murders in the Building, the Hulu series. Oh, yeah, God, that was good. Oh, it was so good and such a relief. Again, I'm older than you, and remember when Steve Martin came on the scene. Remember when SCTV showed us the brilliance of Martin Short. And hey, man, I'm like, all right, you gotta have you gotta have younger audience, so you're gonna have Selena Gomez. She was fantastic. She was great. I've never paid attention really to her music or her uh, Disney work as a kid, but God damn it, she was great. And keeping up with these two comedy masters and was very much in every scene when they're all together the scenes where she wasn't with them were still great i just thought it was such a brilliant comedy mystery uh that just blew my mind so that's four 
And then, uh, man, I'll tell you, his second season was as good as the first uh, on Apple TV for All Mankind, the alternate universe uh, look at NASA. Loved it. Lo- I mean, I'm, I'm such a sucker for anything with uh, astronauts. Um, Ad Astra, I, I love Ad Astra. I don't think we ever talked about it, Matt, but I, I love that good movie. movie. Yeah, that's a good movie. Ben, well, Bendis thinks we're nuts. And so does <laughs> Sam Humphreys. And he's like, Sam Humphreys and I are laughing at you for liking Ed Astra as much as you do. And I'm like, ah, come on, man. Moon buggies on the moon shooting at each other with ray guns. Are you kidding me? Moon buggy chase. That's right. That was awesome. That was amazing. <laughs> was that, that was James Mangold, wasn't it? No, that was uh, James James Gray, I believe. Okay. James Wrong Gray? James. Uh, James Gray? Oprah James Gray? No, that's a different James Gray. Okay, I was going to say. That's really? James Bray, I think. Okay, all right. I believe, you know, again, I don't know. Um, I might be mixing up my Jameses also, but I'm pretty sure it was James Gray who's done a bunch of, he's made a lot of really beautiful, excellent movies that nobody has seen. Uh, <laughs> like We Own the Night is James Gray. I love that and, movie. Oh, I love um, that movie. The Yards is James Gray. Two Lovers is James Gray. Um, the movie he made right before this was is it the immigrant? Uh, and then the, this is the lost city of Z. I want to say was that. I think that's him as well. He's made a lot of really good movies that very few people have seen. Okay. And Ad Astra was one of them. It didn't do very well. But anyway, um, yeah. I mean, of the ones of the movies of the shows that you mentioned, the, all the ones that I've seen, I enjoyed. Which is not that many of them. I, I've been wanting to check out the Superman show. Uh, I haven't had a chance to do that yet. I'm I'm going to have to take your recommendation and uh, check it out because that's one that I've been hearing a lot of good things about. But uh, only, only Murders in the Building, my wife and I watched that, and that was probably our favorite show of the year. That was really fun. Um, yeah, Hawkeye I thought was really entertaining. I enjoyed that as well. It was such a nice surprise. I mean, the trailer pretty much told us what it was going to be, but Haley Stanfield was so great as Kate Bishop. And I didn't see that coming. I mean, I like Jeremy Renner anyway, and I really love how much both of them were were so great in the in the TV show. Everybody was great in the TV show. Ver, Vera Farmiga, uh, everybody. I, I forget the name of the actor who played uh, Swordsman. Uh, and well, it, and you it, mentioned earlier Florence uh, Pugh. You know the the new Black Widow. I thought she was terrific on yes. it. You know, like her and Haley Steinfeld together. Like to me, if I was. You know, if I was Kingmaker John Suntress myself, I would be like the second season of the show should absolutely be, it should be you know Yelena and uh, and 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 Hawkeye or something yeah, like Kate, that. Like yeah, get yeah. The two, like no, just give you. the two of them their own season. Like I think that would be tremendous, actually. No, she, you're right. Florence Pugh is such a delightful surprise and and so great in it and everything. I mean, well, we're already, I you know, I do. I don't know if we spoil the final little moment or not, or you know. Uh, I haven't spoiled anything. You're the one right. spoiling things left and right. I didn't spoil anything. I don't. Want, right, don't put that right. on me. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And and truly, the whole. I mean, because really, we experienced Marvel Television all in 2021, from WandaVision to Hawkeye, and I really enjoyed all of them. Um, my favorite was Hawkeye, but then uh, I would put Falcon and Winter Soldier next, then Loki. Than WandaVision. And I liked all four fine. And I and I especially appreciated the inventiveness of Loki and all the different crazy shit that they did in Loki. Um, and I liked the comedy of WandaVision. It um it kind of dragged for me, I have to admit, WandaVision at the end of the day. And whereas Falcon and Winter Soldier, I was on my edge of the seat the entire time, and just the legacy of Captain America and the way that it was explored in that show, not only through Sam Wilson and Bucky, but also uh, bringing in John Walker as they did, who I think is a very, uh, they made that character. They really leaned into the complications of that character more so than I think the comics ever have as much as I appreciated when John Walker showed up in the comics back in the day. But I I really thought, and again, for it to be uh, Kurt Russell's kid, uh, I thought it was, I thought he was kind of appropriate. He had that, kind of uh, initial Steve Rogers look, but you couldn't miss that chin, that Jay Leno chin. So it kind of made him almost like, yeah, he's not quite Captain America. And it's like, well, that's the point of the story. And right. then my, my God, um, oh shit. And I'm, I'm not remembering his name. The wonderful character actor that played um, Isaiah or, uh, or um, yeah, Isaiah Bradley. 
Oh, yeah, what is his name? He's in uh, Alias. He's on Alias, yeah. John Therese. Jones from the Justice League. Um, yes, he's terrific. Oh, and, uh, and shame on me, man. All right, someone from the audience is going to get it. Mario or Steve or somebody's going to chime in and uh, and immediately get it. And shame on us for not remembering his name. Because I luckily had the, the fortunate uh, opportunity to talk to him and the rest of the animated Justice League cast. We did a table read of some great uh, Justice League scenes during the first year of COVID. And he was on the show. And, oh, he's so good. And honestly, I, I'm like, that guy deserves – I really felt he should have won Best Supporting Actor for the you know, the Emmy for that because I really think he showed the depth and complications that Robert Morales was doing in that original truth story. And I think uh, I think they really captured that. It was uh, – really, it was uh, – like I said, it was so much about the legacy of Captain America with uh, – Carl Lumley. Thank you, Corey. Carl Lumley. That's it. Of yep. course. Yep. There you go. Thank, Thank you, you, Kerry. Very nice. Well done, sir. Yeah, great, great actor. Love him in everything he does. Hell, even even the early '90s Fox show, The Mantis. Who can forget The Mantis? I could. I did until you until you mentioned it just now. I had forgotten it, but now I remember it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I I feel like I had almost the uh, opposite ranking of the of the uh, Marvel shows that you did, but that's that's fine. I mean, I my favorite was probably WandaVision, just because I found that was. I don't know. It felt like the most inventive and interesting and, you know, to make, you know, for this company to kind of make a big splash in television, to make a show about television and playing with the medium. I thought that was pretty fun. And I thought they did a great job of uh, kind of, you know, aping the look of the old shows and the the mysteries and, and stuff that they kind of did in that, uh, you know, in terms of like what what's actually going on here. I thought that was pretty entertaining to follow, you know, week to week uh the 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 falcon and winter soldier show you know the stuff you mentioned i thought was good i almost felt like um you know like that was the best part of a show that was kind of a little unfocused a little all over the place um you know like they could have almost made that you know like instead of making that something that kind of was in the background of a couple of episodes they could have made you know that character story <clears throat> the whole you know more of the central focus and, you know, you mentioned John Walker again, like, yes, I agreed. I thought he was great too, but I don't know. It was like the two lead characters uh, to me were almost like the weakest part of that, that show in some ways. And maybe it's just that I like the, the, the you know, the stuff about who's going to have uh, the shield and all of that. Like, uh, it just seems like the comics that that part of it was based on. I feel like some of the Ed Brubaker stuff just a little more richer and more interesting in terms of like the global espionage stuff uh, and the character dynamics on the show. It just felt a little, I don't know, like it's supposed to be kind of like a buddy comedy, but they, it wasn't all that funny. And you know, all the stuff with the flag smashers, I never really fully understood like who they were, what they wanted uh what they had to do with you know the the blip as they call it and and all that it just seemed it seemed like a bunch of um very worthwhile pieces that maybe didn't entirely fit together so that was not you know i would have put i definitely would rate one division and and hawkeye uh and loki above above that one that was probably my least favorite of the of the live action shows anyway they're still surprising us with stunt casting, and I loved uh, Owen Wilson and Loki, and I loved um, Julia Louis Dreyfus showing up as uh, Valentina, the spoiler, Contessa. You spo you know, spoiler, no spoiler, John. Oh well, yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, that's all right. What are you gonna do? <laughs> JD says I was disappointed in the Hawkeye show. The Marvel shows have lost their edge. To me, Daredevil was the best, but even if they make a new uh, DD show, it would be softened up. Okay. Well, their their audience is, you know, their streaming service is Disney Plus. It's an it's a it's a family audience. Yeah. It's an all ages audience. Um, so yeah, probably it would be if it was on Disney, it probably would be uh not quite as dark. Um, they could put it on Hulu because they own that as well. I suppose it's possible, but so far they've <clears throat> other than some of the weirder, you know, animated things and and the leftover stuff from before Marvel Studios was making the TV shows. It's that you know it all has been going on Disney Plus, and that's sort of the what they've established is like the home for the Marvel Cinematic Universe TV shows. So 
I think if they were going to to make another one, it probably would be less uh, less dark and violent than than the than the Netflix show. And I think that would be their. They would say, "Yeah, it is," because that's you know we're making a PG or PG thirteen rated uh, you know product for a family audience. That's that's their that's that's Disney. That's their goal. Understood. Um, other TV shows that I did love, and I wrote them down. Uh, Reservation Dogs at uh, FX is an amazing show. Um, I love the HBO Max series Hacks with yes. um, oh my god, Gene that is Smart. such yeah. And I love Gene Smart. And you know, years and years ago, she made that Robert Wool film Mistress, and that to me was like wow because I, I enjoyed her on Designing Women. I thought she was great, but Mistress was like her moment of depth. My first awareness of how great of an actor she is beyond being silly, you know, uh, Charlene or whatever her name was on designing women all those years ago. But man, I really, I, I really appreciated this. Uh, it's a, for people who don't know, it's kind of a Joan Rivers, older uh, w- woman comedian who is starting to feel her age and uh, the, the offers are drying up. So they suggest that she pairs up with a young hot writer who ironically just gets canceled inadvertently for something she kind of throws out there and says, and so they kind of need each other and they hate each other. And uh, it's, I think, a great, great look at uh, uh, comedy and uh, and the count and the um, the uh, generation gap. I mean, I really boy, there's an old word, but it's true. I mean, and it's I, I think it, I think it was quite successful and I, I really appreciated it. I thought it was terrific. Yeah, that was another one that my wife and I really enjoyed, too. Yeah, you're. You're naming all the shows that we watched together this year. So, yeah, that's another one I really loved as well. And it's funny now uh, because Alex Chung says, just got hip to Mara Town. Great show. And Gene Smart was amazing in that as well. <laughs> the Gene so Smartessence awesome. is upon us. Yes. We are. We're living in the Gene Smart age. Eh? It's it's Gene Smart's world. We're just living in it. Yeah. <laughs> so we mentioned Squid Game, of course. And that was terrific. And again, that's why. And I love this about a lot of other shows that are showing up on the streamers, we're really getting the best of international television from many countries. And I think that's terrific. And, and I, and I welcome that. And it's wonderful that there are more of us that can handle subtitles and the like, and still find great enjoyment on, on great, uh, great entertainment. I, yeah, I agree. It's all, you know, it's very, it's like, it's encouraging when stuff like that takes off that, that uh, yeah, that, it doesn't all have to be as much as we enjoy these things, you know, Star Wars and Marvel and and all of that. Like it's exciting when people are talking about, yeah, a, sh- a show from South Korea. I think that's the best. To me, that was the best part of it. Like you said, like that, it proves that yes, people will watch subtitles. They will, you know, they're interested in in. It's just got to be the right thing, you know, whatever that is. And maybe John the Kingmaker can explain to us what the next thing will be. <laughs> But whatever it is, like Squid Game absolutely had it. And uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. Like to me, that's the most exciting part is is that, you know, you can, you know, that these kind of things can take <clears throat> take off in every country. Like it was a huge hit in like every in every country around the around the, the world, which is that's to me is like the best that is the best part. Yeah, that um, and it gives you hope that, yeah, that there's going to be more interesting things from other places all over, you know, all over the globe that because Netflix is in every single country now, anyway, it's like that they're, you know, that the, the things that they make in these international territories, the best of it will wind up, uh, you know, will wind up here that we'll, and we'll get to watch it, which is fantastic. And yes, Jean Smart was also in Watchmen and she was great in Watchmen too. She's, I'm telling you the Jean Smart of sons, it's, it's, it, we're, it's, we're living in it. <laughs> Move over McConaughey. She's killing it. Isn't and, it? And, and Hacks, I, I'm pretty sure the second season is is happening, right? I mean, I'm almost I believe positive. you're right. Yes. Yeah, so there's going to be more of that. And I'm absolutely, I'm so looking forward to that, too. So Totally. And while we're talking HBO Max, I mean, Curb was great, I think, again, this season. I enjoyed it. Uh, Succession, of course. Um, you know, it's... Yeah, I mean, and I'm, and I'm, uh, as far as what's coming up, I'm very excited for uh, Peacekeeper. In Peacemaker. That's Peacemaker. Be peace he makes peace. peace. He doesn't keep the peace. He makes peace. He makes the peace, indeed. Peacemaker. Shame on me. Paul Kupperberg would slap my face right now for getting that wrong. 
Uh, he he wrote uh, several peace, peacemaker stories back in the day. Um, and uh, yeah, I uh, what else did I want to say? I, I I mean, that's pretty much my list as far as the TV shows that impressed me. Are there other TV shows? No, I mean, you touched, you honestly hit like the big ones that, because like I said, like my, I'm mostly focused on movies and then, you know, that, that because the world, the, 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 the traditional movie things, especially these Disney ones like Marvel and, and Star Wars have, you know, they've all glommed, they've expanded blob-like, they're just con constantly, you know, expanding outward. And so, uh, like all of that stuff I, I keep up with, but. Uh, beyond that stuff, it has to be, you know, something that I can watch with my wife who has, you know, like she's not, she's not, uh, you know, like saying we got to watch the new episode of Hawkeye tonight. Like those are the things that I'm watching, you know, by myself. So, oh, wow. You weren't able to pull her in a Hawkeye because it, no, so it hasn't, that, that didn't, that did not. Yeah. She's not. Yeah. Cause, cause it really, strangely, I mean, she hasn't been begging to watch the book of Boba Fett. I'm like, are you sure? In this one, he climbs out of the Sarlacc pit for like 20 minutes. You're not interested? No? You're just going to go to sleep? Are you that's sure? A, I can appreciate that being tougher. So, okay. Yeah, but really, want, I, I did. I guess love, if that's what you want, all right, I'll watch I, it by myself. I, I wasn't. I mean, they again, in the trailer for Hawkeye, they told us that it was going to be a Christmas story. But I really thought they, they nailed all the family stuff and – you know, funny, funny sweater night and hanging out. Uh, eating, you know, God, even when uh, Elena and Kate are eating mac and cheese and stuff like that, it was just like, this is great. This really all these little moments and stuff. But Jenny yes. wants to know uh, Lost in Space. I will confess that I am uh, behind on my Lost in Space, but I understand that they stuck the landing and finished the series uh, the third season and uh, people really enjoyed it. I'm glad to hear that. Um, but again, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I don't know about you, Matt, but I can't binge when it comes to TV because I don't want it to end because when we get to the end of a season and it's like, all right, we'll see you in two years for the next season. It's like two years, but, I, but I'm angry now. <laughs> I want to watch the rest now. Don't yeah. do that to me. So even like Sherlock, when it was on Cumberbatch and uh, Martin Freeman, I would purposely, because I knew the middle episodes were standalone stories. I would I would save those and then watch them as I knew, all right, in a couple months it's coming back. So now I'll finally watch that second chapter. But I still haven't finished Netflix Daredevil, as uh, uh, I believe J.D. mentioned earlier. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I like to – I don't want these things to end. And I could say that, honestly, about Luke Cage and um, Jessica Jones. I love what I saw. But I did kind of end early because I'm like, I don't want this to end in case there's going to be another season. Well, now we know there won't be other seasons. So rather than watching it to the end, you stop watching it. Then they don't make it because they're like, well, people aren't watching it. They're just stopping in the middle. Oh, no, no, no. You know how John didn't works. finish it, guys. Let's wrap it up. Forget it. Let's, let's, let's put a kibosh on these. They, they rung the curtain on Jupiter's legacy, you know, two weeks after the goddamn thing came out. So I mean, yeah, you know that that doesn't I'm happen just anymore. Teasing, yeah, I'm I know, no, no, and you're right about. I know, that. I know the I know feeling that you're talking about, like with, like with only murders in the building, like you know the the last episode. You hit the last episode, and you're like, arr, arr. and then now we're now we're. I guess they're making that that they're making that now. So I guess yeah. Yeah. probably by I would guess the fall that the the new season of that will be will be on on Hulu. But like, yes, I I know that uh, that that uh that pain you're describing all too well it can be quite can be quite frustrating yeah now i've been sparing you my star trek hate yeah star trek is something that i i love i've always loved but like i i i do have paramount plus now for work but i sort of didn't have it when all those shows started and i just haven't it's another thing that i have not had time to catch up with but i know you're not really a big a big fan but honestly matt i'll tell you and i truly mean this I am loving the Nickelodeon Star Trek show, Star Trek Prodigy. Oh, that's it's, good. It's great. It's great. It, it it absolutely is what they said it was going to be. It's a great introduction to Star Trek. It's a great Star Trek 101 sort of, you know, learning course. And I, I'm so relieved at how much I, I love it. Oh, this is interesting. Mario says the biggest disappointment for him 
was uh, why the last man couldn't finish it. And again, there's another great example of, oh, we'd have to watch that. Well, they already uh, said it's only going to be it's the one canceled. season. And I'm like, yeah. Ah, I'm like, poor man. I felt terrible for uh, Vaughn, for Brian K. Yeah. Vaughn. I saw him. I saw him in uh, in Baltimore, and I'm like, hey, man, I'm so happy for you and everything. Finally, I'm like, this is great. And then, wah, wah. so maybe another network will pick it up. I certainly hope so. Yeah, I think that. Uh... I mean, that's one of the all-time great books, you know, comics. And I just feel like they took so long to make it. They, you know, like the real world kind of outflanked them in terms of it's a, you know, like, I don't know how much of an audience there is right now for deadly viruses, you know. And Well, that's, and that's true. But you know, the, idea, the idea of a meritocracy world. I think it's very, uh, you know, I mean, Oh, and, and the book, you know. I mean, I was, I mean, I was buying, I have all, I have in one of my long boxes in my parents' basement, I still have every issue of why the last man, like it's an amazing book. I just feel like they took so long to get it off the ground that, you know, there's, you know, there's <clears throat> things that come out and they just seem to capture the zeitgeist or what, you know, that, that thing where they're just the right thing at the right time, you know, like a squid game just comes along at the right moment whatever is you know you can never do it on purpose it just has to happen no, you're right Absolutely. and and why the last man felt to me like it was like the opposite of that you know it was like it just it hit at a point where it was just like do i really want to wa like wallow in this right now when i you know like i i can't go outside my house without a gas mask i gotta watch this guy and you know what i mean it's like I'm hip. i just think i think that that was already an uphill battle you know, for that kind of a show when it uh, came out. But I, yeah, that's true. I was going to actually say like th that, you know, again, Kingmaker me, not just you, John, who doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Like, yeah, Station Eleven is a show that's on right now and it and it is similarly themed and it is, uh, it does seem to be doing better getting and having more conversation. So I don't know, maybe, like I said, maybe I'm just as big of an idiot. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about either. <laughs> No, I do think it's timing. Got at the beginning of COVID, the the first year of COVID, I noticed on Roku they were promoting Outbreak, and I'm like, maybe not. <laughs> maybe this isn't the time to revisit that fine Dustin Hoffman movie. Yes, but uh, you know, and it just kind of cracked me up. So no, I get what you're saying. Timing absolutely is everything, and uh, so many great shows and movies uh, don't get the attention they deserve because of uh, unfortunately unfortunate timing. I was today earlier for a, a different project, I was talking to Alex Cox, the filmmaker who did Repo Man and Straight to Hell and so many other, Sid and Nancy. And uh, yeah, he made that point. And also I had to correct myself because I said, because he is, I love listening to him talk about film in general. And at first they said, well, you know, you're, you're such a, uh, a student of old Hollywood. And I said, wait a minute. No, no, no. Not just old Hollywood, really international films as well. And, and it's certainly his work lately has been, uh, in in Hispanic markets more so than than uh, straight up Hollywood and stuff. So uh, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. Um, oh, JD wants to know what we thought of Midnight Mass. I didn't see Midnight Mass. I must confess. Same. It's another one. I'm. There's just, there's but just I, too many television shows to watch. Like I don't understand how people. Like I I you know granted my job requires me to see watch a lot of movies, but like I can't keep up with all the movies, much less all the the TV shows. So. Um, and that's one like my my wife is not a horror fan. So again, like a lot of the TV that I watch is the stuff that she wants to watch. So like Only Murders in the Building, Hacks. That's more her that's more her vibe. Yeah. That's so cool. Midnight Mass, if I was like, hey, do you want to watch this horror series? It's from the guy who did Doctor Sleep, she'd be like, Absolutely not. You that's can watch awesome. that after you watch the latest book of Boba Fett. By the way, which I, without me, I love it. I mean, I, again, I think it's following that Mandalorian uh, formula. I, dude, I, I'm sure you feel the same way. I'm sure all of us do. I love that they show the conceptual art uh, during the closing credits. Mm -hmm. I just, I honestly, I could literally watch just that and a show of just that and just be. Because it, it just that would be a lot cheaper for for Disney actually if they they would <laughs> imagine how much money they could save if they just could put the concept art on the air. <laughs> I they're just, spending a lot of money they don't need to spend. 
Ryan Miner. I can't remember his name. Miner Ding. The Miner Ding. It is Miner Ding. All right, I was going to go there. Uh, I did a panel with him at a C2E2 a couple years ago, and all he did was show his art, and it was so great. And I'm like, you know, can I can I uh, video uh, the panel? He's like, no, they won't let me do that. No, absolutely not. And I'm like, well, can I at least put out the audio? He goes, yeah, they'd probably not like that either. I'm like, all right, well, these 200 people and I are going to enjoy everything you're showing us. That's cool. You know, they're making the coffee table books. I don't want to get in the way of commerce. That's that's all right. But I, do, I mean, and and like you said, even though Boba Fett was in the uh, in the sand pit for for 20 minutes in the first episode, I'm like. I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm enjoying this. this is the concept cool. art of the 20 minutes was absolutely incredible at the end. Absolutely. <laughs> that guy you mentioned though, is he's a great like Instagram follow. Cause he does post, you know, his, his uh, artwork is incredible. I actually interviewed him a few years ago just cause I was a, you know, a fan of his and I was, and, sure. and uh, yeah, we, there was some things we couldn't do. You just, you talk to that guy like that. There's just some things they're just not going to talk about because that's the way it is, you know, but, uh, it was, it was fun chatting with him and he, yeah, nice guy. Absolutely. Very, but, nice. uh, yeah, he's, he's awesome. Follow on Instagram. If you don't follow him, follow him just because yeah, he posts like, you know, when Spider-Man comes out, he's posting Spider-Man concept art from not just the new movie. Mostly it was older stuff. Cause oh, yeah, that's, again, they, 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 they not going to spoil anything, but Right. Um, you know, you see the, you know, each of the costumes from each of the movies and stuff. And it's really, really cool. I love that stuff. Yeah. He's a brilliant artist and I, and I love the finished product that he shows. And yeah, I mean, it's usually from several years before, so he's not, you know, in trouble and that's great. So no, you're right. He, he's, he's amazing. Um, let's talk about uh, what we can expect in 2022. Uh, uh, we got a new Batman uh, trailer recently and uh, that certainly looked interesting. Yes, yes. You mentioned, I know, I mean, I think Peacemaker is uh, this week, right? On HBO Max is the I premiere. Believe, if, if not this week, next week, but I know I it's coming it's really soon. 13th, I believe. Oh, there you go. There you go. But yeah, I mean, there's that. That's coming out. And, and if, if it's not this week, it's next week. And then, uh, yeah, Batman. I mean, I'm very curious to see... Um, I don't know, just the, the you know, it's uh, the reaction to it more than anything else. Uh uh are because you know the last i guess the last now the last batman was was really more the the zack snyder uh right you know batman but that batman never got his own solo movie um no. so to me it's like when i say the last batman i still in my mind it's still the christopher nolan batman which of course was so excellent and and it just had this um the fervent uh, response uh, from from you know fans, and so I'm curious, you know how I'm always curious how these you know each new iteration is going to be received. I mean, it looks very interesting. Another, I mean, th these movies now it's kind of amazing how great the cast and all of them are, but the cast is spectacular. And I mean, all the trailers that we've seen so far look they look good to me. I mean, I'm certainly interested i'm very yeah. curious how it's going to be i hope it's i hope it's great i guess we'll i guess we'll see i hope it comes out you know that's the other thing these days is you you know especially with movies is you never know if they're going to actually come out or if they're going to be pushed back i think i if i had to bet i would say based on the incredible success of spider-man i think that probably the movie will come out there that i agree if that it you know it just showed that for the right movie the big movie with a certain audience that's a little less wary about going to the theater that you could still make a boatload of money. And so, uh, I don't know. I mean, it certainly could still get delayed, but if I had to lean one way or the other, I would, I would think it probably will come out in March like it's supposed to at this point. I agree. And I think bolstered by uh Spider-Man success, I think they will roll the dice, but you're absolutely right, Matt. I mean, Nightmare Alley is getting great critical reviews and nobody's seeing it. And, uh, uh, you know, um, West Side um, Story, I thought I was, was say, amazing. Yes. Yep. And yeah, nobody's and that, going to see it. No, yep. totally bombed. Yeah. It's, uh, it's you know, it's like there really is just, you know, it, it, we're in this world where it's almost like people will pay not even so much for the movie as they will pay not to be spoiled. You know, it's like, I, I don't want to, I have to see it first so that nobody on the internet can ruin it for me. And totally. th there's, there's no spoilers, uh, that anyone is worried about in a 50 year old musical that everyone already knows, you know, like as, 
as amazing as and and I thought West Side Story was absolutely amazing. Like I I think it's better than the than the earlier movie. To be honest wow. with you, wow, um, it was great. But that that sense of urgency is just not there for and especially for that audience, that younger audience, you know. Um, that is still going to the theater because, you know, I think that generally that is the audience that's going. And I, I get it, you know, that sure. if you're a little older, you're a little worried, more worried about COVID, whatever it is, like, or you just don't feel like leaving your house. I get it. I totally get it. Um, and, but that's what we're seeing. It's like, you know, so maybe if, if uh, they start a whisper campaign that um, Ben Affleck and Michael Keaton uh, will show up in the Batman. Maybe that will get people in the theater opening weekend. But uh, but other than that, yeah, I mean, I guess Batman himself is probably enough of a draw. But I do think that that was. I mean, that's a. I think that's a huge part of why Spider Man was so successful. Is that people there? They created this sense of uh, of urgency in people that they felt. Maybe not John, but most other people felt. I cannot wait to see it. I must see it. You know, it was viruses it will, be damned. I have to go and see this movie before it, you know, anyone else spoils it for me. And it worked. Clearly, that strategy worked. Yeah. No, you're right about that. Not on John, yeah. but on most people. <laughs> on most people. And well, um, again, I, man, that's, this is where I am starting, I, I guess, as someone that's getting older. And uh, can, yeah, that's all right. You go ahead and see it. I'll, I'll wait a couple of weeks when everything dies down. And then obviously found ourselves in COVID even worse. Uh, but also, I guess I am part of the lab rat audience that is getting content sitting at home and watching this stuff when it comes out that way. I, I don't know. I really right. don't know. Um, JD wanted to know any thoughts about Foundation. Um, I haven't seen it. And one of the reasons why was it got mixed reviews at best. Uh, they said it was kind of stiff. and. Um, not a not a great execution of uh, of the idea, which is a shame. Another classic sci fi story like Dune and, and some of the others, but uh, yeah, Tough it's to uh, adapt. Yeah, that's another uh, one. That's, that's another one where again, I can't convince my wife to watch Foundation. That's just not going to happen. Did you She's... watch Brave New World on uh, on uh, Peacock? Nope. No, that was a bit of a. She's not going to watch that one either. Yeah, I can understand that. And but again, uh, you know, on you know Apple, you know uh, Foundation is on Apple TV Plus. So we watched, but Ted Lasso, we love Ted Lasso. Love Ted Lasso. Ted She's Lasso's gonna watch that good. one. We watched every episode of that. Sure. sure. That's uh, my wife is not as much of a nerd as I am. What can I tell you? I hear you, man. Uh, TikTok boom and uh, the heights were really good, says Mario. Yeah, TikTok um, boom, I thought was really, really um, was fantastic. That's on Netflix. I don't know that might have gotten a very cursory theatrical release at all. I know In the Heights is another example of a movie that, you know, was, was just didn't, you know, that one was on HBO Max at the same time it was in theaters. That was one of those Warner Brothers films, but just a, a crowd pleasing movie that probably five years ago would have done really well in theaters with an audience really reacting to this exuberant musical and again, there's no surprise cameos in it. They're not real people. It's like I'll watch it on HBO. I'll wait, you know. So it's, uh, you know, if you do care about that theatrical experience, it can be somewhat, uh, some of these conversations can be a little depressing, I suppose, because, yeah, some of these very good to excellent movies are just kind of, you know, it's they're just not connecting with a theatrical audience that doesn't mean that in five years they won't be beloved by people who saw it on hulu or hbo or netflix or whatever but um you know when these things are measured in terms of how successful they are financially and that determines what gets made next can be that can be a little depressing and or worrisome all right i'm gonna ask you kingmaker we're getting back to the macro side of of all of this yes. um there can, been I a change, lot of can I change my my name here so it says Kingmaker instead of Matt Singer? Sure, is that well, okay. I don't know if you I think you'd have to leave and come back, but that's all right. We will all right next time. But um you, there've been a lot of articles about the health of the various studios as they suffer with COVID and the lack of revenue from theaters. And what does it mean for the future? Are you do you think you know what do you see? Do you I mean more acquisitions, more mergers? Uh god, even Last week at the end of the week, suddenly the CW is for sale 
And they're right. like, yeah, you know, ever since uh, the, the network came out in 2006, it hasn't made a profit. It's been a money losing situation for CBS and Warner Brothers in, in their joint ownership of uh, of the CW. But, yeah, any any thoughts on that or the movie studios, too, that, uh, you know, Paramount's looking for a winner and, uh, you know, really, really hurting for some big success. Yeah, I mean, I think it uh, it's really about like cracking this code of what is going to make what is making money these days and you know it seems like that the the answer is becoming a smaller and smaller answer it's like well you could make this or this or this and now it's like well you could make this this one thing and um it that doesn't uh you know it we, we we've talked about all these different shows and streaming services and, and all of that, but it's like a lot of those, a lot of these streaming services, um, like they, they, they don't, they're not necessarily profitable. They, they're losing money hand over fist. So the question becomes like, how long is that sustainable? Um, and so it, yeah, it does. It is worry. It is worrisome, uh, in some ways. Um, do I are, are more of these companies going to merge? I mean, it's always possible, but they're they're running out of they're running out of mergers to make. I mean, there's not too many studios left. So I don't will will they merge down further? I guess perhaps I guess I think the more likely scenario is the ones that don't already have their own pipeline of streaming whether that's like a Sony or, you know, whatever, like they're going to wind up I don't, I'm not saying they're going to get sold or bought, but just, I just see like there, it doesn't seem like there's much of a future in not having your own streaming service. Um, whether that is connecting with an existing one or starting your own or what, what have you. It's just like, um, it, it, that, that does seem to be the way of the world these days, especially when there's so much uncertainty about movie theaters themselves. It's like, when you can't rely on that revenue, well, where else are you going to make money? So, yeah, um, you know, and, and, you know, Disney has had a lot of success with Disney plus uh, maybe not entirely financially yet, but it just in terms of like the, the just the sheer amount of uh, um, subscribers they've already yeah. got, you know, yeah. and competing with Netflix in terms of uh, subscribers and eyeballs and consumption and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, I, I don't know. It's 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 a weird time, you know, and, and so much just seems up in the air in terms of like six in six months, things maybe could be a little better in movie theaters in six months. They could be just as bad. Maybe they could even be worse. Who knows? Like, For real. yeah, it's man. really hard to predict. I mean, we wouldn't have probably predicted two years ago that we would still be talking about this two years later. I don't think, you know, Agreed. so. You know, um, it's 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 hard. It's hard to predict where any of this is going to be. Like I said, in six months, much less six years. So the only thing I could say is it is a very interesting time as an observer, and um, you know, and a lot of the things that are being made are still really good. It's just a matter of are they being successful enough to make a profit make a profit and ensure that the next great thing gets made. You know, that's yes. As a, as a fan or as a, as a viewer, that's sort of the main thing we hope about. And, um, you know, certainly there's going to be another Spider-Man movie. I'm not, I'm very confident about that. And as a Spider-Man fan, that's fantastic. I'm happy to say that, <laughs> you know, and Steven Spielberg, even though West side story wasn't a huge, he'll be hit, I'm sure he'll get to make whatever he wants to make next. He's already finished basically his next movie, which sounds there you really go. interesting actually. Absolutely. Alex, but, uh, uh, go ahead. Excuse me. Finish your thought. I'm sorry. Joe, no, just that it, I just worry about, you know, like some of these other movies and TV shows we've mentioned that haven't been massive hits, like what these people want to make next, you know, will they get to make them? And I, I hope so. I'm with you, man. Uh, Alex says uh, the new ABC sitcom Abbott Elementary is the office set at an elementary school. Just two episodes so far, and it's a fun watch. Could be the next feel good hit like Ted Lasso. We'll see. Um, Again, the the four networks are certainly having their own issues in terms of uh, making new stuff and, and gathering an audience with the competition of cable and streaming in ways that they never, I think, expected to happen. No, the the media landscape is changing under our feet. 
And uh, it's, as you said, as an, as a fellow observer, it's very interesting. And nobody, know, nobody knows the one, as William Goldwyn used to say, the one thing everybody knows, nobody knows. And it's totally true. Absolutely, man. Uh, great conversation, Matt. Honestly, I, I, uh, any other thoughts before we wrap as far as what we've discussed? No, it's been a pleasure. As always, buddy. Likewise. Thanks a lot for watching, everybody. Great questions from the audience. Yes. Uh, I hope the uh, audio audience will enjoy this as much as uh, the video audience was able to. Uh, it's going to be a fun week here at Word Balloon. I'm going to talk to Brian Bendis tomorrow night uh, about another anticipated show that's coming to uh, the CW and Naomi, HBO. Naomi, yeah. Naomi, absolutely. Another thing, too, and I forgot to mention regarding Batman, uh, great news that Ed Brubaker is part of the creative team on the companion cartoon to the new Batman movie, Cape Crusader, yes. and very excited about that. And uh, I'm looking forward to my next conversation with Brubaker, whenever it is, uh, because uh, he had been hinting about that, and now we can finally talk about it. Um, that's going to be great. And I already love the fact that uh, not only Bruce Tim, but the great James Tucker is involved with this uh, from the animation side. And I think uh, that uh, a new ba Batman animated show is in very, very good hands and can't wait. And also it's going to be supposedly a, a PG-13 show. So uh, they're a little, little edgier than, uh, you know, maybe the last couple of Batman shows that we've gotten. So very excited about that. But uh, all that coming up this week on Word Balloon Live. Everybody, thanks a lot for watching and listening. 